Welcome again. So today we are going to look at tetanus, a very interesting disease. Not as common as you'd think, but when it comes, it comes in a very serious way. So we're going to, uh, first of all, like look at what tetanus is and explore its causative organism, basically even focus on its bacteriology and then uh, look at its distribution and pattern and then how it presents uh, on a patient and then uh, how it is diagnosed. Then later on, we look at the treatment management. And then finally, as always, we look at how we could prevent uh, from uh, getting this uh, very bad disease. So to start us off, tetanus is basically a bacterial in, uh, disease, okay? Because it's caused by a bacteria, and this bacteria is unique in the way that it actually focuses in the nervous system, and actually leading to some uh, uh, problem of the nervous system uh, that ultimately leads to over stimulation uh, of the muscle contraction and then which now brings all these signs and symptoms together. And uh, <clears throat> what we know that is very crucial about tetanus is that this contraction of the muscle would necessarily not be as uh, fatal if it didn't actually involve the, the, the breathing muscles. So once it it starts now involving those muscles, breathing becomes a problem, and that's how it becomes a life-threatening disease. Uh, so tetanus is also commonly known as lockjaw, and we will see why um, it's called that way. So let's look at the causative agent itself. So the causative agent is um, um, Clostridium tetani, okay? So it's of the species of the Clostridium. We have different um, bacterial uh, species under Clostridium. We have Clostridium tetani, Puffringes, okay. Uh, we have different types of Clostridium. So Clostridium tetani uh, is basically a gram-positive rod, as you can see on your end. Normally it has a characteristic um, club uh, sort of uh, morphology. So the, organ the organism basically is an, uh, an obligate anaerobe. And that's why you'll find it not uh, close to contact with air because basically oxygen is uh, leads to its death, okay? It's basically toxic to it. And um, we, we have a lecture video on uh, anaerobes and um, aerobic uh, bacterial organisms, so you can go back and look at that. So it forms uh, terminal spores, giving it uh, uh, this characteristic drumstick um, shape that I've just talked about. So basically what I also want to say is uh, Clostridium tetani can occur in two ways, okay? So it can be in its, um, the rod form, okay? And then we can have, which, and, which is a vegetative form, and then we can have um, formation of spores. It all depends with the environment that it finds itself in. If it's in a very harsh environment that is not uh, conducive for its growth, then it's going to be in a spore form, which is very, very hard to destroy. And then, then if the, the conditions are, are conducive, it will just be in its normal uh, road form, and then it can divide and divide. So in terms of um, pattern, over the years, the cases of um, tetanus has uh, actually uh, declined drastically. And I, that's why I said from the onset, it's a disease that nowadays is not that common. So we know that these pores are mostly found in soil and they can periodically be found all over um, Africa. But it's more common in rural areas than in towns. And you can basically try to think about it. In towns, we'll, we'll have most of the areas in the environment have uh, the, the, the we, all, we, we either have roads or uh, the, the pavements are cemented and all that. So we don't have a lot of encounter with the soil or things that would easily uh, bring out this bacteria. But in the, in the rural environment with agriculture and all that, uh, the, the infrastructure is not that good. So basically the soil is all over and you'll uh, find these um, cases in abundance. So high-risk groups are normally uh, newborn babies, um, depending on how they have been um, um, born whether it was a hospital uh, assisted delivery or it's at home 
and what equipments they use to like example cut the cord and all that uh, farmers um, soldiers and children okay so how is it transmitted the organism basically we said it's an anaerobe so it normally lives can be found in the bowels of animals or, or humans and like in, in animals, like when they, they pass on their feces and then drops to the soil, then the bacteria, actually the spores, the spores will actually end up in the soil, okay? So when it's passed out uh, in feces, the spores can survive in um, harsh conditions. The spore now may present in the soil contaminated uh, by the feces. So we say the spores are highly resistant and they can stay in very harsh environment, including very high temperatures. So even if when you're trying to boil and uh, doing all that, like in autoclaving, you have to, to use a very high temperature in, um, so that actually you kill them, okay? So that's why like autoclaving is a very good way, okay? Of, uh, just simple decontamination measures would not um, really work. So tetanus itself now, we, we've talked about now where it's found and all that, but now the spores, it, the spores themselves actually now enter the body and how do they enter the body if you have a cut on your skin or something and then it comes in contact with for example soil or something that has cut you and has these spores then it enters a contaminated wound okay so which wounds do uh which wounds would we be looking at when we're talking about clostridium tetani so like stamps of um, an umbilical cord from a newborn baby and uh, for example, that stamp is having infection or becoming necrotic. It provides a very good environment. And what I have to say from the onset is that um, Clostridium titani likes not just any wound, mostly a necrotic wound. A necrotic wound will mean that we don't have a blood supply there. Therefore, the oxygen levels in that area is reduced. Therefore, it provides a very good anaerobic environment. Okay, so then we have um, Clostridium actually um, um, uh, thriving in such an environment. Then we have crushing wounds, which ultimately uh, end up being necrotic stab wounds, which are deep. Uh, if whatever you're using to stab, um, actually by any chance has the Clostridium titanium. Wound with foreign bodies, human and animal bites. Yeah, yeah. So. Even human bites or animal bites can can uh, be be um, uh, a way of actually getting the tetani inside. Uh, endometritis, like after an abortion, so when when, when like they're trying to uh, get rid of the contents, okay. Uh, then when they are using that, like if you're using the vacuum uh, way of actually aspirating whatever is inside the the uterus. Um, if they are not well sterilized and they have the spores for Clostridium titani, then end up in the in the uh, endometrium and we have endometritis and then we have a Clostridium being introduced. So surgical wounds for equipments that have not been well sterilized and then chronic uh, ulcers like from jiggers or leprosy because now the skin will be open and give a chance for the, uh, the, the spore to go in. So what happens basically after now we have We've looked at the, the conditions that, that enable us to get it. But now what actually happens once you get it? So in a, uh, when you get an infection, okay, um, the, the, the bacilli itself, the tetanite bacilli, it, it lodges in the tissues because from there now, the toxins. And what is very bad by there about this whole thing, it's not that the bacteria itself does not cause the disease, it's the toxin that it releases that actually goes up to the nervous system and then uh, it blocks the the work of um, the, neuro, the neurotransmitters that are inhibitory. And now what happens is that now we have constant firing. That constant firing leads to constant contraction of the muscles and that's where we have the problem. So if, if we simply just explain it, is that we have um, the bacteria, okay, gains access to whatever tissue that we're talking about, mostly tissues that are necrotic or all that, or we don't have good blood supply there. So it's an anaerobic condition. So it goes to the tissues. Then this, the bacteria releases toxins 
these toxins goes to the nervous system okay they have a way of uh, they block the actions of the inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters so we will have constant firing okay or activation and then uh, so we'll have contraction uh, of muscles and by the way when you're talking about the muscles you're talking about mostly the skeletal muscles eh? Uh, we don't, uh, the, the, the toxins, the tetani toxins do not actually work on the smooth muscle. So in the skeletal muscles, constant contraction, no time for relaxation. And that's why you end up having the status of a tetanus, okay? So basically that is how um, the pathophysiology in a simple way uh, actually works. So however, when the spores are so when the spores are swallowed, the bacilli can live there and multiply with no harm because the toxin is not absorbed from a intact bowel. So this is what we talk about, like for example, neonatal tetanus, um, which is normally a fatal condition, and causes the baby to actually have adverse adverse uh, problems. So after birth, blood stops flowing to the umbilical, therefore the the cord area becomes necrotic. This provides a very good environment for. Um, for, for actually the tetanus okay this will happen if people are cutting the the cord with things that are, are not sterilized that's why one of the one of the reasons that the cases of neonatal tetanus have declined is because we've had increased hospital assisted deliveries and not the like with the traditional birth attendants at home and all that they don't have the equipment that are sterilized so what are the signs and symptoms? We talked about the lock jaw and the reason is simple is because you're having contraction of these muscles continuously. Okay. So, and we end up having even the, and actually that, that's the first, so that is one of the first signs that you'll ever see. Okay. So the first signs that you will actually see is lock jaw. They normally go and start affecting those muscles. Okay. And then you have the, the jaws locking. Okay. So that's the lock jaw. This lock jaw gives this person a, a very weird kind of a grinning expression. It's like the grinning. It's called the devil's uh, grin. Okay. You see the other name, uh, Rhesus Sardonicus, but um, it's a grinning expression. They call it the devil's grin. Uh, so if, if such a person will obviously have a difficulty in eating and difficulty in swallowing, irritability, and other things like fever, tachycardia. So, um, Apart from these two, lockjaw and the devil's green, we also have um, another classical sign which we look at, which is also related to the uh, contractions that we're talking about. But in, on, on top of that, we'll have other things like uh, restlessness, lack of appetite and drooling, okay? Normally this occurs within an incubation period of five to 21 days, uh, but it can range also from three days to three months, depending on uh, how deep or how uh, the, the load of the of, of the bacteria that you have so the increased tone in the jaw leads to the lock jaw the trismus or lock jaws and then we have the devil's green we've called it rhesus sardonicus so later the spasms become now more generalized so you notice the first it starts around the head region yeah the face region and then now it goes and becomes generalized so when it becomes generalized we have opistotonus and you can see this baby uh, this child the, you, you form like an arc okay where they like the back of the head wants to get to the uh, to the heel of the of the legs okay so um, the next spasms may resemble may resemble those ones of meningitis but now this one is very very um exaggerated okay and then you'll have now other problems now when it starts now affecting the the breathing muscles like um it starts having hypoventilation and then what will kill the person is um having asphyxia and exhaustion from all that so the the, the classical signs are lock joris or sardonicus which is the devil's green and uh, opistotonus so in newborns what do we expect to see the same thing but they will have inability to suck because also obviously the muscles that enables sucking requires some um, contraction, relaxation of those muscles. So they later appear apneic and uh, cyanosed because of also the breathing muscles being affected. And then because of the contraction, they will, all, they will appear having like a clenched uh, fists and um, 
lock jaw and also flexed toes okay so that is what we commonly see in children by the way if you go to nbu newborn unit you might get some of these cases like a neonatal tetanus ah uh, so diagnosis so diagnosis is that, that easy so but most of the use is just by the clinical presentation because they they are classical for for tetanus so the triad itself can be useful lock jaw uh, devil's green and opistotinus can be uh, indicative of, of that. A spatula test where they insert a spatula inside the mouth and then normally you should have a gag reflex and, uh, and um, that would be normal. And then, But in, in, in a person who has um, tetanus, once you put the spatula inside the mouth, they'll just clench it. Okay, They just clench it and then it will be held there. That will be positive for the spatula test. That means that they have it's indicative of tetanus. So also culturing, but it's difficult. Culturing is difficult because culturing an aerob uh, uh, is a difficult task, task because um, any contact with, uh, with, with the environment or oxygen basically kills them. Okay, So you might try to culture and then you find no bacteria there and you think that they actually there is no bacteria yet. There, there's a bacteria and and it is anaerobic. So uh, serum tests to get a tetanus toxin. I told you the toxin is the is what now causes this whole problem. So that can also be done. Okay. So management uh, tetanus is basically a medical emergency. Okay. So it's not something you just do it patiently and send the patient home. So they will require hospitalization. Then immediately, normally they are given tetanus antitoxins. Um, tetanus vaccine is also there. Drugs that uh, control spasms, like uh, they can be given diazepam, and then they do aggressive wound care um, together with some antibiotics like metronidazole. So, normally, these patients will require ICU care. Okay, yeah, so you'll find this patient if you have this patient in a low level facility, they'll have to be referred. But as a nurse, what will you do? Cleaning of the wound, obviously, because of the wound care, and then they have to be put in an environment that reduces the stimulation, whatever stimulation, yeah? Like, so the, it has to be a quiet environment and a dark room to minimize uh, provocation of the spasm. So you'll see these patients actually being put in a dark room, okay? Uh, fluid to be given because of the fever and all that. Um, so if, if uh, they'll be losing uh, uh, a lot of uh, fluids, uh, remember also they are not really taking things in, yeah? Uh, even um, swallowing is a problem. So IV fluids will be also good. So if patients develop uh, respiratory arrest due to spasms, so respiratory support might be needed. That means depending on whatever you're looking at, might uh, give oxygen, nutritional support, and obviously monitoring vital signs and ensuring the elimination needs are, are met. Now, these patients are normally nursed in a semi-prone position and you can see the way they are. Um, and this is important because of all those things that they're producing okay and the spasms that we are having so uh, the, the the foods are raised a bit as you can see there's a pillow here and and the, it helps in lung drainage because now the the muscles the the, the respiratory muscles uh, they basically are not working very well so even the lung expansion and the uh, contraction is hampered with and and therefore will have secretion building in and suctioning might actually be needed. So sometimes sedation might also uh, be needed. So we have talked about vaccination. So one of the, why, one, also, one of the reasons that we have had a reduction in um, cases of, um, of tetanus is because of the, of the vaccination schedule that we have. Uh, like in Kenya now you can see uh, we have DPT, which is given at six weeks, ten weeks, and fourteen weeks uh, since the after the delivery of the baby. So uh, DPT has diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. So they are given three doses of tetanus. If you, if you look at it, that's one of the ways. Moreover, we have um, um, tetanus uh, scheduled for also pregnant women, and uh, for our like uh, premigravida, first time mother. Um, who is pregnant, they're given their first shot uh, in their first visit, and then the second shot one month later, okay, after the first shot. So within the first, in the first pregnancy, they'll get two uh, shots. Uh, 
Then uh, in the second pregnancy, they will get the third shot. And then the third pregnancy, they get the fourth shot. And then finally, in the fourth pregnancy, the pregnancy they get the fifth shot. So it's it, it assumed that after that, the woman will have a, some sort of long-term uh, protection against tetanus, and it will help um, both her and it will be conferred also to the baby. Okay. So prevention and control measures uh, that we might have. Uh, we have proper surgical uh, treatment of wounds. So we use uh, well-sterilized equipment so that we don't introduce the spores again. Uh, vaccination schedule, that is the childhood uh, vaccination and then the pregnant mother vaccination and also the normal wound schedule like when you get for example you're working somewhere and then you get cut or, or or you get stabbed whatever and then you end up um having a um that kind of penetration of the skin with some foreign body so it's normally good they go and get a get a tetanus shot okay so that's all about uh tetanus so i hope you've uh, actually enjoyed and uh, it's one of the diseases that have uh, lost some sort of um, um, people really nowadays don't know so much about it because it's becoming rare and rare, but it's good that we understand about it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I hope.